Hello and welcome back to the How Are We Farm Lab podcast with me, John May, and my co-host, Jazz Dickens. Jazz Dickens. Do us a favour, right? Like this video, subscribe, and ring the bell. Cha-ching! Anyway, today, we have a very special guest. We have Liam Moore. Liam, welcome. Thank you. How are we, fam, lad? No, how are we, fam, lad? I'm good, lad. Well, I'm right. I'm good, lad. Bring the mic. Yeah, okay. we're always right. So, Liam, tell us a little bit about yourself. <laughs> Where did um, you grow up, Liam? I grew up just on the on the, the edge of Walton, but more not a screen. So, uh, Walton? Broadway. That's when people say, where do you go, where are you from? You go, they say Walton. What do you mean is by the Asda. Yeah, by the That's Asda. That's right, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Jacks. So because we were like kind of caught in the middle, do you know what I mean? It was like kind of the got forgotten screen. land. Yeah, that's it. Um, and we weren't famous before the Asda. That's it. The Asda put us on the map. And um, you know, basically, <laughs> um, years ago you had to have a few bob if you had the Asda because you had to have had a car. Yeah, we had the Beatles and the Asda, didn't we? That's what we had. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, we're the only ones who say the Asda, aren't we? Because it's called Asda. But it's like the Asda. The Asda. Like, Is it the only one? The Asda. <laughs> If you're from Wigan, you know what Asda stands for? Something, something Dairy Association. <laughs> it was a collective. The anti social Dairy Association. Yeah, it was, a, it was a farmer's collective. It was a market where they all oh. come together and sold the products and it become a, a, a dairy association and then it become the Asda and then Walmart bought it and Liam's from Biden. I'm from Biden. Yeah. And so, yeah, I, um, I, I'm from there. I went to Warsaw. Got expelled. Yeah. When I was 13. Um, had dreams. Oh, I'm not going to ask you what you're expelled. Had dreams. <laughs> <laughs> had dreams of being an ice cream man, fulfill that. Is that and what you wanted to be? I had more dreams there. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then, you know, I've always been a singer. It was like kind of, you know, you got like talents and giftings. It got me out of trouble in school, really. Do you know what I mean? Because I used to be able to sing and that. And especially at Christmas, because I was the only one who could sing. Five gold rings, falsetto. Yeah. And, I've, <laughs> and so, um, you know, it, it was always like kind of leading up to Christmas. The teachers got on like dead sound with me, whereas the rest of the year they hated me. Yeah. And um, and so. Why do you used to suck up to you leading up yeah, to Christmas? Yeah, keep playing sweet. To, to keep keep playing sweet, sweet for the 12 days of Christmas. <laughs> and, um, and so I've always sung, you know, I've always been a singer. Um, I've always wanted to sing. And so. Uh, that's that was my kind of later path. I've done other things as we've all done. I've worked on the markets, on the heritage, on Gracie, you know, Same. selling the jag. Yeah. <laughs> selling all the jag in 1990. You know, when we got like Jurassic Park on the video cassette. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you remember? Yeah. And that like and we used to have a we used to have a video and we used to have a, a telly. And we used to have this motto side them before the buy them. And that yeah. like so we used to have like kind of crowds and that, and there was the trading standards. Trading standards, he was Peter Maudsley, I think his name was. Right. And he was just make Darth Vader. He was horrible. The one in uh, mate, on the heritage? No, he was on the trading standards. And he wanted to nick everyone because he he because people, you know, he was saying that we were cowboys and whatever. But we had this motto and we were there faithfully every Sunday. So we got this Jurassic Park when it first came out on video. And so we were saying to everyone, listen, we've got Jurassic Park. What was the copy like? Mate. <laughs> It was like Poltergeist. <laughs> <laughs> what happened was, right, there was not on it, they were all Demics. So we sold them for a ten of each. Ten? Yeah, we sold them for a ten of each. Made two grand in 20 minutes. But they all came back the next week. But we, we, we sorted it out and that. But you know, we, we, used to have, we used to have like Jungle Book and Peter Pan when the Disney didn't, because they never used to release them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? They used to release them every seven years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was like kind of, oh, back in the day, Used to be off me barn and you that. You were offering like, a service, Liam. We were. You were offering a service. A friendly you were service. filling a gap. Yeah, friendly you service. Should, it's, it's that been. my first ever job, though. Was it, yeah? yeah. Selling on DVDs. The Henry gave me a job, eight, yeah. She also was eight, yeah. Wow. Yeah. On Edison, Charlie, wow. um, Gracie. 19, 1991, 92. Was that, was that the crossover from VHS to DVD? Well, we, we, had, we had the tapes. We had tapes and we had video video cassette recorder. I figured out how <laughs> to do it one day, you know. Yeah. I got the video from downstairs and I sat there and thought, right, I'm going to learn how to copy videos. And I'd done, and I'd done Jurassic Park. Oh, and I had you? like three copies of it. <laughs> <laughs> Said like, like, like Pat and Bernie's wedding, my man and dad's wedding, I just record over that. And I tried to sell them for a five and no one's having over. 
See a copy as well, like. Oh, and I copied the video case as well in the library. <laughs> it was black and white, found in our video case, and I started to sell them. But, and, you know, I never quite made two grand like you did. <laughs> <laughs> but we were skint the next week, so. No, but we used to do really, really well. And back in the day, we were party animals. So I'd be off my back. And so I'd, like, come down, like, I'd be in town and all partying and whatever. And I'd have my Ray-Bans on at 8 o'clock in the morning, like, oh, come on. Don't be shy <laughs> and all that, like you know, just totally and utterly off me cap. And um, and and so what happened was um how I kind of become a singer was I had it um with James's uh, James Barton's brother, Dwayne. We had like a hot dog van, we bought a hot dog van, and uh, that was for the editors on the editors and that. We had a spot there, it was great. And then next minute I was pulling the, the trailer and I'd wrench me back. And I was done in. I was done in for about two years. So I ended up selling the uh, my part to Dwayne and that like. And then I was like, "What am I going to do?" Yeah. I just lost my ma. My ma, like like when we talked about having me and I, I lost my ma like when I was twenty two, so it was thirty one years ago. And um, and I used to go down to you know the um, the grave and that, and I'd be like, "Ma, you know what? What can I do? Do you know what I mean? I can't because I, I was done in with my back. I couldn't walk or whatever." And back in the day and all that, like what they used to say was, is that um, if you have an operation on the on on your back and that, it's seventy thirty, meaning that you won't walk. Really? And I was yeah. like, see you later. I'm on one. You know what I mean? So it was minds over matter. I had to overcome it. I was on Voltadol and all these like kinds of my tablets, but I had to like slowly but surely walk around Sefton Park and whatever and get me mind like yourself Chad, you know you got like a boxing and yeah. you know what I mean you got to stay focused haven't you and get over the pain and and, and whatever and, and then what happened was I um, I, I was out one night Do you remember Be a Belly Billy no. remember Be a Belly Billy in the <laughs> karaoke in the army in the army and that like and we were out and had a bevy and all that and then next minute he had a karaoke and he said hey, you know anyone want to get up and all that so I got up and um, basically, I got up and said, listen, I'll do Phil Collins and all that. I'll do Against All Odds. And so next minute, I'd, I'd done the song, like, standard ovation. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. It was like, wow. So that's the first <laughs> time you performed it? That was the first time I performed it. And so, you know, because I was, like, seeking back in the day, you know what I mean? It was like, I was really, like, kind of, what's my next path? What's, where, where am I going? And whatever. And so I remember, like, getting, like, all these plaudits and whatever. And he said, you need to go on Stars in the Eyes. You know, you need to go. And I was like, nah, see you later. It's just a glorified karaoke show and all that. Like, And so he said, no, he said, honestly. And it was Billy. And he he died last year, I think, or the year before. And he had a major influence in me in me going onto, the, onto Stars in the Eyes and that. And that was the, the start. And, and how I ended up really becoming a singer is my next-door neighbour, Steve, um, while I was like kind of recuperating and me back and all that, I was living in my half fellas. Um, I used to have this big like f off like PA and the speakers. Remember the big speakers? They were like right, the fifteens yeah. and that like type of thing. So I'd have these two fifteens. I had me like thing, you know, me PA and that, and I'd be singing and I'd be pracking and all that. So I'd kind of do, you know. I'll be working my way back to you, babe. <laughs> and all that. Like, and then I'd start doing Gabriel and Collins and whatever and all that. But the thing was, is when I was doing all the Detroit spinners and that, I was there and all that, they're knocking on the wall and that going, tear it down, <laughs> will ya? Tear it down. But when I was doing the Collins and, then, and when I was doing the Genesis stuff, it was silent. So I remember going up to him and I went, do us a favour, Steve. I said, no one was pracking. And he went, yeah, and all that. He said, listen, sack all that other off and just do the Collins. Yeah. And that's what happened to me. I ended up just becoming like a tribute to Phil Collins. And I was Bill Collins, the sound yeah. of Phil. Is that what and you call I, Yeah, Phil Collins. Collins. Um, and so it. I used to, like, kind of, before I went on Stars in the Eyes, Tell I us, used to do I, rounds here. How would you apply <laughs> to go on Stars in your eyes? Well, you just, like, great, kind of, well, well, back in the day, it was like... Hello, like, Stars in your eyes, how yeah. can I help you? Yes. <laughs> But basically, that's what it is. You phone up. Do you know what I mean? You phone up in that in that way and that like kind of thing. You just um, <laughs> just do 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 do. What's that weird <laughs> noise? <laughs> sorry, mate. Um, sorry about that. Can you turn your mobile off? <laughs> <laughs> so um, you just phoned up, and and the reason how I ended up going in for it 
is that there was a there was a guy called Les Les B that he was an agent and I was doing these like gigs and next minute he seen me and he said I can get you on stars and eyes and I went no I, I've gone through this I said I don't want to go on he said well how much are you on I said about 150 he said well if you get you 300 quid yeah. 350 quid would you got to say give us the ball uh, so I signed it sold well, out but going on that as well you're going to get more money yeah, after yeah. that aren't you and do you know the thing is though John it's it's like it's it's a great way as you you know it's a great way of like you know showcasing, showcasing yourself. yourself and you know getting your you know your PR done getting all your posters done getting all your, your promos done do you know what I mean yeah. and then you're just lashing it out and it was like a year so I was like kind of it's like this COVID thing you know I was 20 you know 24 and then, then it was next minute two years later it went out yeah. and all that like type of thing so I had a lot of time to prepare and tell the people and say listen being on the show you know this is this is what who I am whatever and all that and so I ended up um, getting taken on by stars in your eyes because it was stars in their eyes it was stars in your eyes uh, agency Cyril Myers and um, he took Did he me take on, on a lot of people from the show? He took me on board, yeah. And, you know, it was it was great because, you know, it was the first time I was going around the country and, and whatever and that, like, and getting top tolly, you know, for singing yeah, the brilliant. songs that you love singing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? What was it like once you did go on the telly? Did you get more away from that? Yeah, yeah. It, 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 was, it was great. It was like, I ended up then not doing Liverpool because the thing is, is that, like, they had a ceiling, a wage ceiling, and out of town, you were getting double, yeah. treble, you know what I mean? So I'd only do a few people who were new or yeah. whatever, and I'd do it. And then we'd chuck it out then. The Derby Mills, that was a massive one. Um, the Setter and Vine, Tony Flett, I'd done that for a couple of times. Um, but I never usually did Liverpool, um, just maybe just the high profile ones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so when, <laughs> what happens after that then, Liam? Did that show, how long did, did that carry on going? Or yeah, did so, that so what happened was, is that um, I was engaged, I was engaged to be married and um, I, I was living with the girl and uh, and I split up, I split up with her. So I'd just been on Stars of Eyes and doing all this, it was great and, yeah, it was a massive and whatever and all that, like next minute, like I split up with me birth and that like type of thing, you know, when I was devastated. And I think what it was, and we can relate to this and that, is that um, when I lost my mum a few years previously, I wasn't able to mourn it. I wasn't able to grieve. Yeah. I wasn't able to go through the process yeah. of mourning it. And and I think because of that devastation of like what happened with, with the uh, the breakup with me fiance and that, um, that, it has it has a lasting effect on it. That happened to me, Liam, as yeah. well. It, I do. I think it took. My mum died, and I went to work. I had a day off mm. and went back to work. I sort of, I thought it was easier to forget that she died, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and you don't realise that till later on. So it took me ten years, yeah. but that ten years of suppressing it and not letting it process naturally, mm. it had a real devastating effect yeah. on my life. And it does, doesn't it? Because yeah. something inside it dies. You look at, like I looked at my, the baby's mom, I looked on her to then take the mantle mm. and she weren't going to fulfill no, it. So then was. we broke up yeah. because I had like new expectations of it. Yeah. But if it's a grieve properly, but I can, I can relate to what you're saying. And the, the, the other thing is, is that you don't even realise it, is that like you're looking for someone to mother you. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? You're looking for someone who you want to get with and all that, like you want them to be your I think mother. it's an approval yeah. thing. I think you go to your mother for approval yeah. and then, or that validation and then you're expected from your partner mm -hmm. and, or someone else and you're not going to automatically, you're gonna yeah, that, gonna, well you might, but you can't expect that. Yeah. You know well what it mean? comes with limitations or it comes with yeah, add-ons, doesn't yeah. it? What are you going to say, Jazz? You get a choice when you, when you do one. I lost Nancy about five years ago, I still haven't. But do you think you get a choice or do you think one day it just comes? I think, I think, um, I don't know. I, I I just for me, I my mum died in my arms. Do you know what I mean? And I was twenty two. I was on top of the world. I was doing you know the graft and all that. Um, I was earning good money, and I was like, you know, tell boy, this time we'll be millionaires yeah. next year. And that and something died inside of me that night. Do you know what I mean? Something and it's never it's never returned. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's I'm, I'm a different person than what I was at 22 years of age, when my mum, but I never got on with her, I never got on well with her, you know what I mean, it was like, it was only the last year that I started relating to her, and if you remember, like, but Paul McCartney done um, The King's Talk, 
right. in 1990. And I bought her a ticket. And she said to me, that's one of the most amazing things that she'd ever done, like, ever been to. And the most amazing thing that she'd ever been given. And that, because my mum was from Scotty, you know what I mean? And, like, my aunt fellas from Scotty and all that, like, type of thing. So they grew up with nothing. And she wasn't getting on well with me, our fella. They also but, grow up with, from Scotty, a hardness. Yeah. And I, I don't know, I, I can't say for everyone in that area, mm. but I know how my mum's mum was. Mm. So she then passed it on to her, to her daughter and then she then passed it on to me. But I'm liking to break the cycle. Mm. It's like, uh, they love you. But they struggle to express yeah, it. it. But is. I can relate to what you're saying with the last year with your mum. I done something similar to my dad. I sent him to Australia. I took him on special things. It was almost like I was trying to, I don't know, break the cycle yeah, and, yeah, and yeah. recoup something. Do you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, I can yeah. understand what you're saying. Yeah. Well, that's what happens. And like you know, um, I just it was like with the um, with, with Paul McCartney and that she went and I went to pick her up. And it, it was, it was it's like kind of July the 17th or something like that. A month later, she was dead. Mm. But something came over me. Do you know what I mean? Something came over me because they'd all let out and that. And she was about an hour late. And I was like, where is she? And all that like type of thing. And so basically, um, she was the last one. And it was where City Pets used to be. Yeah. You no, know, where the Cunards used to be. And like on the Williamson Square. And I was parked in there with the taxis were and that. And I looked and there she was. She toddled in and that. And... But something come over me, and on the night that she died, I'd been to Wembley the day before when Liverpool had played Man United, and uh, I got in late, like kind of, you know, broke down and whatever. And then anyway, just basically what happened was, was um, I got up, goes in the in the, in the the bathroom, goes to like get a wash and that. Next minute, get the bleeding tap on and do that, you know, kicking off on me. And I went, yeah, all right, see you later and all that. And that was the last time. I ever spoke to her. Was it? Do you know what I mean? And so what happened was, I was coming home from my friends uh, about half five, and I was coming down uh, to my Mars Road, and next minute, my mate said to me, you know, do you want a cup of tea and all that? And I said, yeah, all right. So I went in. He said, what was the match like and whatever? So I said, yeah, it was sounds and all that. So next minute, he said, I'll just get you tea. So something come over me again. Do you know what I mean? And it was like, I've got to leave. I've got to get off. So I ran, I just said, listen, mate, I've got to get off. And I ran over. And the next minute, my ma was on the floor. Oh, really? And she had blood coming out of her, like, her nose and that. And she was just motionless. I remember just diving down onto her, starting to press down onto her, give her the kiss of life. And was crying out to God. You know, we were saying about, like, um, faith and all that. Like, crying out to God, being brought up a Catholic, being brought up and all this, like, kind of, you know, God's with you and whatever cried out to God and said, God, please save me, mum. Save me, mum. Save me, mum. And I remember pressing down on my mum's chest and she looked at me and she smiled and then her eyes dilated and then that was it. Oh, and then it was the time of the, like, just when the paramedics started coming out, so it was like 15, 20 minutes later. And they came in and said, listen, mate, she's gone. Do you know what I mean? And, I, and for ages, for years, I carried that. I carried that in the wrong, kind of, in a negative way. Do you know what I mean? Of saying I could have done that. You know, the little voices in your head, should have done this, should have done that. You know, any other, like your other, your brother would have saved it and all that. Like, so I had this guilt. Yeah. I had this depression. I had this, like, kind of heaviness and the weight over my shoulder. And it was just heartbreaking, like, kind of, you know, thinking about it and, and, and thinking, you know, I could have had so much more of a relationship with it. So I was feeling guilty. Do you know what I mean? And, and and so I, it, it really, really affected me, my mum's death. You know what I mean? It just really, really affected me. But going back to the singing, that was the kind of the start of it, of like, you know, um, you know, going on to Stars and Eyes and, you know, doing the, the gigs around Liverpool and that. You're right. It's about approval. Yeah. It's about acceptance. It's about wanting to fit in. It's about kind of your, your ma, your da going. Like, my uncle was convened at a Fords for 20 years. So he was there looking after all his men. And, and Is his dad still his, alive? Yeah, yeah, he's 82, yeah. And so he, he was looking after all them and all that. That's why my ma and da never got on. And that, like, but, and so I never had that, like, probably that affirmation and that approval. And so when I was doing the singing or whatever, it was like, this is a great way 
of wearing a mask. You can feel yeah. a hole temporarily, can't it? <laughs> but you wear a mask, old Jazzy. Yeah. You can yeah. you can be something that you're not. <clears throat> I think what we do is I think I think we all got someone we seek approval from, whether yeah. it's your parents or whether it's your partner or whether it's a friend, blah blah blah. And it's like I I I've learned this something I've learned about myself. Like one minute I'm running marathons, one minute I'm doing a bodybuilding competition one and I get these massive highs mm. and I don't necessarily enjoy them because the reason why I'm doing them is for approval That's not from you not from you mm. not from people on Instagram or Facebook yeah. from my mum and dad That's right. but they're dead yeah so I'm never I'm gonna do these things and get the same outcome all the time and I'm saying this to you and that's why I don't get the approval. The only person I can get approval from is myself because unfortunately they're not here, but I was chasing that. Yeah. I was chasing that validation from my mum and dad to show them, look, I am good enough. Look, look, look at me, notice me. And I sounds like maybe it was something similar with you. Absolutely. And, and you know, the, the heartbreak, it's the heartbreak because you, you're finding something where, as were you saying, something that you, you, you're trying to put your trust in and your belief in. So that was my girlfriend. Yeah. So I don't know if the emphasis and the pressure on her showed on that like kind of thing because yeah. I, I wanted to be muddled and but I wanted then, to be just looked after and whatever. You, it, might, she, you mm -hmm. might have started looking elsewhere at this point. I don't know if you did, mm -hmm. but, you know, you start looking, I don't know. I started looking elsewhere. Well, I wasn't. I was faithful in, in that way, but... What happened for me was um, the inevitability of splitting up. But when she did go, it just, it was like the, the cards, you know, the cards, the pyramids. Yeah. Take that cards out, take that cards Everything out. Just... Jingo, you know what I mean? Wait, it sounds like me and you have had a very similar yeah. experience. <laughs> so, so the thing is, is that like, and that's when my whole world capitulated. So what happens... You know, even though you're like you're being on the telly, even though you're successful, even though you're in a good dollar, you're going around and you know, people are lauding you. Yep. And all I wanted to do was like kind of when it's on the gig, come out and like talk about me, me, me bit and like the breakup and whatever and all. And they yeah. wanted to see Phil Collins, yeah, they just wanted you to be Phil Collins or Liam Moore or Stars in Their Eyes, or yeah. you know, they wanted, and I was like, no, I wanted to. And you're like, see you later, yeah, and cool. you become a little bit of a beard. You, you're gonna drain people with it, yeah, unfortunately. Totally. I find myself that when you are doing really well, that you, you close friends around, just say, I'll just let you have your fun. And then you're alone, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> my best friends just leave me to enjoy yeah. my time. My yeah. partner leaves me, my parents yeah. are just going to have your fun. And I'm yeah. the most successful I've been, but I'm alone. It yeah, can yeah. be like that, can't it? Yeah, absolutely. Totally. And the, the, the thing is, though, is that if you haven't got that foundation, you know, because, you, you know, I'm, 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 a, I'm a believer now. I'm a believer. You know, I'm a believer now. And, I've, I've, you know, I've been following... Jesus for 23 years. Tell, you know what I mean? tell us where that sort of so, happened and what So what this is how it all started off, really, because the breakup, you know, I had a breakdown, a bit of a, you know, emotional breakdown. It wasn't a mental breakdown, it was an emotional breakdown. But what I was going to say is, is what happens even though you revert to type, don't you? So you go back to your mates. You go back to your mates who you used to, like, you know, go partying with and whatever and all that. And then before you know it, you're on the beach. You know what I mean? You're partying, you're doing this, you're doing that. And all you're trying to do is fill the void. Yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? That's all. And you're yeah. still broken. Yeah. As what you just said, Jazzy. Yeah. You know, like you go out partying and it's light and all that. Next minute you're going home, yeah. you're climbing the walls. Yeah, yeah. You're suicidal. You you're know trying what I mean? to build it's your like, house on a sandy yeah, land. That's it. It's never going to work. <clears throat> that's a scripture, boy. And so, um, yeah. you know, the thing is, is that um, if you haven't got that foundation and if you're not building your life, on that like kind of foundation, it is on sand. Yeah, that's what it is. And it's just gonna keep. It's like I I call it my self esteem, and this is something I've learned about myself. Uh, whenever I build myself up, my low self esteem just sucks everything yeah. back in, yeah. and I'll build myself up again. And I'm sick of getting back up. Yeah. And every time I do get back up, I go, "Ugh, have I got the strength to get yeah. back up?" Yeah. I always will, but I've got to find strength. Yeah, yeah. And now I've realised, hang about John, you're building your house on a fucking sandy yeah. land. <laughs> so build it on a solid rock, but yeah. that solid rock's me. Yeah. And that's it, any voids inside. I can't fill it with a woman. I can't fill it with a car. I can't fill it with a house. Only I can fill it. That's right. And the sooner the better people realize that. Yeah. And then no one can hurt you. You're solid yeah. and you can build a good life. Absolutely. Uh, but, but I do believe faith is a, is, is a strong Well, you can fill it with your And I understand you know I mean? that that's what people do say that that, that hole is. You can put it religion in there. They call, yeah. they call it the God sized hole, don't they? Yeah. But, you know, as I said, there's, there's, there's always this like kind of domino. You know, you've got to press that first domino. Maybe my mum's the first domino. I turned away from God. I, I was just like, kind of, see you later. If that's you, F off. Do you know what I mean? And I just parties and whatever. But I was still, I was still done in. I was still heartbroken. 
And then it was Miguel, you know what I mean? And then it was like kind of this culmination of things. It was just like building up and building up. But but what happened was, in the midst of all that, I'd done a gig in Barrow and Furness um, in the 99 Club, or the 100 Club it was called now. Um, but basically, it was Phil Collins' tour manager. He lived there, he was, he was from Preston, but he lived in Barrow. And so I was doing the gig, and next minute the guy told me, Phil Collins is tall man, is he, is he here tonight, you know? And I went, really? And he said, yeah. So I said, sounds, okay, nice one. And that's all went, done the gig and whatever. And next minute he come and see me. Yeah. And next minute he went, that's boss, great and all that, like, fantastic. He says, I'll get you the gig, you know, with Phil. And I was like, what? He said, I'll get you the gig with Phil. And I said to him, sounds and all that. And we became good mates because he was Beatles fan, mad yeah. Beatles fan. Phil Collins is a mad Beatles fan. <clears throat> and so... We ended up becoming real friends. He then started doing Dance Into The Light tour in 97. You know what I mean? So he was at, like, I was singing, like, you know, I was phoning him and all that back in the day with, <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, <laughs> you know, but, but basically, um, I remember I was on the, I was on the motorway and I got a phone call and uh, he said, Liam, I said, yeah, he said, it's Mike. I said, sounds, I said, you're all right. He said, yeah. He said, what, what dates do you want to go and see Phil? And I went, well, I want to go and see him in Manchester. I said, I want to go and see him, like, maybe in Birmingham and that. I said, just get us two two, two nights and all that. And he said, well, what are you doing on the 16th of December? And then I went, 16th? I went, I'm not on really, because it was like July, something like that. I said, not on, said, it's not on really in and all that. He said, right, you're booked. And I went, okay. I said, where? He said, eh, it's a gig in front of Phil. And I went, Phil? And he went, yeah, Phil. And I went, Phil. Phil and he went, yeah. <laughs> and it was at Earl's Court. And it was his end of tour party. Yeah. Of dancing wow. to the like lights. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> like a party. And that, <clears throat> and it was just unbelievable. Do you know? He said, I can't give you much. I said, I'm not interested in money. Do you know what I mean? I said, give it to the, the owners. It was shelter then. Do you know what I mean? I said, give it to shelter. And all that, like he said, sounds. He said, we'll sort it out and that. So even though I was going through all that pain and all that like kind of stuff I was going through, well, you said another high, you know, you're getting this big high or whatever, and I've got this thing to look forward to. So I'm kind of thinking, me and Phil, I just want to have a bevy, you know, we can yeah, do this, yeah, we can yeah. do that, we can do duos, you know what I mean, back in the day. And and so um, basically it came to the, like, the 16th of December in Nails Court, and, and as I said, I'd done the gig and that, like, and, you know, I had to do, like, half an hour. Do you know what I mean? And it was like back and sacks and all that. What did that feel like? It was unbelievable. No, no, that you were going to perform in front of Phil Collins. It was, that it was, how many were there? Just... There was about 400. So wow. it was all his bands were there. Yeah, the that Leslie off. Dunlop was there from where the art is. And then Emma Dale, she's in Emma Dale. Right. She was sound. She was boss. She was really good. And um, there was a few others, loads of like minor celebrities and that. And um, all his bands were there. <clears throat> and what happened was... Um, there's a guy who's his best mate called Ronnie Carroll. And he's from Liverpool, it is, and he's from Warbrecht Moor. Um, and he moved down to Surrey. And he became Phil's best mate before he was in Genesis and that. Yeah. And so he ended up like in Phil's bands. He looks like Temis Roussos. If you look at him, he's got a big, like, top jolly beard and all that. Like, And um, he's, like, kind of, you know, his best mate. And so I started, like, honing in on him. I'd done the gig and all that, like, and then got changed and come down. So next minute, he Phil's over there somewhere, you know, and I'm talking to Ronnie and a couple of his bands. And then uh, next minute, he looks over and next like, like that. And I was like, I was like, like that. And so next minute, he comes over to me because I'd met him a couple of times, do you know what I mean? But I hadn't like spoken to him properly. And he went, all right. And I went, yeah, I'm sound. Yeah, I said, listen, I hope you don't think that, you know, I've took advantage of you or, or you know, I'm exploiting you or whatever. And he said, listen, I know you're doing it for all the right reasons, he said. And the thing is, he says it was spooky, frightening, and very flattering. Wow. He said, you even do things that I didn't even know I did. Ah. He said, people were coming <laughs> up to me and saying, do you realise you do that? He said, it was great and all that. And he complimented me on the tracks and, you know, the mannerisms. And I said, do you know what? I said, that was just like you singing in front of the Beatles. Yeah, yeah, I said, yeah. that was my thing and all yeah. that. And he went, no, I, I, that, that sounds and all that. And then from the night, in that night and that, 
you know, I got on with him. I was talking to him, different things, and people kept dragging him away and all that. But he kept throwing it in because he knew I didn't want nothing, John. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, he yeah. didn't want nothing. I didn't want his fair. I didn't want no money. I didn't well, want it. Like, he's massive at this point. Everyone's taking from that. Yeah. And that's why he brought that wear my hat out, didn't he? You know, you can wear my hat. <laughs> and that, like, type of thing, saying you can take me shoes, you can take me clothes. Do you know what I mean? And, like, you know, take everything. Because he's just been getting shanghai and hijacked. Oh. But but I used to talk to him about the Beatles and about Liverpool and, and whatever. And he loves Liverpool. Do you know what I mean? He loves the Beatles. And so, it, you know, we had a really, really good time. And that was the high. And then the next day, it was back to reality. You're going back home now, aren't you? Yeah. He's going back to a 23 year old boss beard and all that, like, trying to do like the camera shuts or whatever. Here's me going back to like kind of not a screen or like where I was. And, and, and I just moved into my house in Oak Lane. And I had this like kind of feeling, and, and it was like, is that it? Is that it? Is that my life? Do you know what I mean? Am I just going to be a Jack Phil Collins singer for the rest of my life? <laughs> do you know what I'm saying? It was, it was like a real like kind of wake up call. And I, and I remember like over that Christmas, um, the two things I wanted, I remember going into my new house and I'd got the keys. It was the next day. And the thing was, Phil said to me, listen, what are you doing tomorrow? And I said to him tomorrow, I said, you know what? I said, I've been down in London and the South, you know, for 10 days. I said, I'm moving into my new house tomorrow. I split open my bed. And I just want to get off, you know, Phil. And he went, Nice one. And I started crying. Started crying in front of him. Next minute he got me. He hugged me. Kissed yeah. me on the cheek. And he went, nice one. He said, I've been there. He said, good luck with Everton and all that. What did he, he was going to get do? me. He was going to get me up the next day. On the last, you know, I got oh. told he was going to get me up for the song and all that. But it wasn't meant to be. You know what I mean? So oh, it is Liam. what it is. When he said that, I've been there, that, that was like a, another similar, similarity between you. That he yeah. done his work, best work on his pain, didn't he? Yeah. Yeah, totally, totally. And, and, and that, you know, as artists and all that like kind of thing, you know, we, I think we blossom and I think we find ourselves in our pain. It's an expression. I think there's healing. I think there's healing in the pain. I think yeah. there's healing in the rest, yeah. in the pain. Do you know what I'm saying? Um, and that's deep and, and whatever and that like, but the only way to face your pain is to face it. Yeah. You can't run away from it. Yeah. You can't hide from it. You've got to confront it. Do you, whatever it's an obstacle, whether if it's like a, a brick wall or whatever, you have to confront it. And 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 that's like we were talking about before, is dealing with your emotionalism, your mental health, dealing with like, you know, your spirituality, de dealing with your physicality, dealing with all them kind of things and whatever, you know, it, it, it kind of really hits home to you, you know? And it's only within them pain and probably the, the, the toughest time of my life that I, I kind of found a new life. Yeah. You 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 went on to become a pastor now, haven't you? Yeah. Well, I, so what happened was on that Christmas, I, I I just moved into the house and the two things I wanted was my mum, I couldn't have, and my girl, and yeah. I couldn't have. And it brought me to a realisation, like me, me house was dead spanking you outside, inside was a shell, yeah. and that was me. Do you know what I mean? Everyone's like, ah, you know okay. I mean? So you, did you feel like it was a clean slate again, yeah. brand new? No, no, I felt as though I was empty and shallow. Oh, sorry, inside. okay. The house was a representation. Yeah. Of well, it just goes to house. show you, yeah, you yeah. could have looked at it that way yeah, as well, I suppose. Have, absolutely. And, and and the thing was, is that I remember getting down on my knees and I cried out to God. And I said, God, if you are real, I want to know. I want to know who you are. I want to know that, you know, that there's a, some kind of purpose and some time kind of rhyme and reason so what's going on? He calls me Ed's wrecked. I've just sung in front of Phil Collins, you know, lifelong ambition fulfilled. And I'm empty. Yeah. What were you saying before? I'm empty. I'm void. There's just nothing there. And and so I remember, like, kind of, I, I just got 200 quid's worth of charge. Boss Charlie, by the way, wasn't Taffy's, do you know what I mean? It was like, not no, no like Taz in it, or whatever. It was off, straight off the uh, Colombian fleet. You know, it was straight off the uh, production line. And so basically, <laughs> but what I'm saying is, I couldn't even have that. I couldn't even have that. And I ended up lashing it down the grid. Do you know what I mean? Did because you? it was like, that was it. I never had a line. And so on the 8th of January, 1998, I was going down to uh, Bista to Redden. And I had a road to Damascus experience and I was going to take my own life. 
And as I was about to take my own life, I heard a voice and the voice just said, Liam, call your friends and ask them about me. And I was just like... Did you actually hear it? Absolutely. But it wasn't like, Liam, you know, like the Monty Python kind of thing or whatever. You know, um, but I knew I heard a voice. Yeah. I heard a voice, I knew it. You got a and message, I was in the like... car and all that, I was in a fiesta. I remember, like, I had my gear in the back and all that, like, and I was going down on that, like, and it was like, what was that? And it was just like, Liam, call your friends and ask them about me. It wasn't a big hallelujah moment or whatever. It was just a now then... You know what I mean? Do you think you had to reach that point? Absolutely. In order to experience that? Absolutely, yeah. And and and, and I do believe, because we're going to go into the other stuff and all that, like, but I do believe that, like, you do find yourself when you're at the bottom, mm. you know, because you strip back. See, I, we spoke about this with Brian Sumner. We had Brian Sumner on. I When was it? Two years ago. I, I, I was like, I, I was struggling to find a strength to get back up again. And I went to this place with Billy Moore and... um. A homeless guy hugged me and he was walking towards me and I was thinking that he was homeless. He probably smelt and stuff like that. No disrespect, but he did. And he was walking towards me and I'm thinking, fucking hell. And as he walked towards me, he put his arms around me and I just felt this amazing um, sense of love. Mm. And that had a real effect on me. Mm. And that sort of changed how I looked at wow. God and stuff like that. Yeah. yeah. And, and that's it, you know, because that's the hands and feet. Because Jesus was a carpenter. He wasn't in the temple you know what I mean? He wasn't in the, like, kind of, you know, with the establishments. He was with the, the, the woman at the well. Mm. Do you know what I mean? He was with, like, kinds of blind Bartimaeus. He was with the prostitutes. He was with the scallies and all that. You know, the disciples were the scallies mm. of the day. You know, they were Galileans and all that. They were fishermen. They were bruisers. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Jesus was a carpenter. You know, at the end of the day, he wasn't a gimp. You know what I'm saying? Mm. He was a dude. And that, like, and when he was, like, kind of going rounds and all that, people would be looking at him going, oh, you lie, don't mess with him. Because, you know, but he's got this message of hope and healing and love and you can change your life around and all that. And that's what happened to me. You know, I I, I kind of called my mates up. And, and what he said was, to cut a long story short, he said, Liam, I know, I've known you for a long, long time. He said, and I've seen the highs and lows. He said, you know the one thing I've never seen? I've never seen you happy. He said, I've known you from the kids. Always and that chasing life, that Always chasing high. it, chasing it, chasing it. He said, no, I've, I've never, ever seen you happy. He said, and you've just sung in front of your idol and whatever. And that hasn't even made you happy. And, and so he said, what have you got to lose? That was the thing. Mm. What have you got to lose? And I was like, I've got nothing to lose. I said, well, what do I do? Well, being a Catholic, it's like five Hail Marys, four half hour. Yeah. What have I got to do? He said, you know what, Liam? Just pull by the lay by and just cry out to God. Like you mean it, and just say, God, help me, help me, help me, and and that was it. That was my transformation, and nothing changed, but it did, because I started like that weight. What that did you? Guilt. What did you take from this when you cried out? What did you take from it that night? Desperation. It was just desperation, Jazz. It was desperation. It was my. I was at the end of my life. At twenty nine years of age, I was at the end of my life. And I had no, no, no other like avenue to go through. Do you know what I mean? There was no other avenue, and that, that's the kind of we live our lives on that edge or or whatever. But you know, I lived my life on the edge and that like, but there was no way for me to turn to. I was void. I was empty. I was broken. I was smashed. I was heartbroken because of my girl. But really, I was probably still broken over my ma, and I'd, and I'd tried to probably hide that. Yep. And try and live my life. But as I said before, if you don't confront it, if you don't visit it, you know, I, I, I'm a great believer in you saying there is that like, you know, some of the tragedies or some of the, the pain and suffering that I've gone, I've had to revisit. Mm -hmm. I've had to revisit and then revisit it under the like kinds of the Holy Spirit with God and all that. And look at it in that way and go, oh, you lie. I understand now. I understand why that happened. I didn't like it that it happened. I didn't like it happened to me. But now I can move on. Yeah. Now I can draw the line. And now I don't need to ever go back to that. So let me, one minute, you're in a house in Norris Green. Next minute, you're in death row. Yeah. Tell us about that, Liam. So, so the, <laughs> yeah, it's like kind of crazy, mad, like kind of life of Liam Moore. Um, and so I, I, you know, I started going to church and, started getting involved in church and you know what I would I I made a deal with God do you know what I mean I said listen I don't want 
the jag, because I, I saw jag over like I've been a jag Phil Collins. You know, I don't want the roller cola. I want the Coca Cola. I want the real deal. And if you're real, I'll follow you. <coughs> if you're real, I'll go to the ends of the earth for you. If you're real, I'll be like the disciples. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I'll do whatever and that like type of thing. But don't give me religion and don't give me the wishy washy and all that. And so, yeah. um. I ended up starting to talk to different people and going to different theatres and, you know, sharing my story and, you know, Phil Collins thing and, you know, give us a Phil Collins song and that like, but I, I met this guy called Eldon and he was from Texas. And basically um, he said to me, you need to get in touch with a guy. He said, his name's John Owens. He's from New York. He was a hippie back in the sixties and all that. He said, but he's got this ministry in Texas like, and he goes into prisons, and I just went, bing, do you know what I mean? New experience. I, I, I was just like, kind of, wow. And he went like that, he said, listen, he said, there's his number. He says, I've got in touch with him about you and all that. He said, just give him a ring. So next minute, rung him up, and I said to him, listen, you know, Eldon's told me to ring you up. He said, get over here, brother, <laughs> get over here. You know what I mean? On the Jesus bus and all that. <laughs> and, um, it was funny, like, but like, I, I, I went over there, Never had a carrot, you know what I mean? Got like 400 quid together. Went over there, never had a yarab and just like ended up staying on this retreat. And basically it was called Calvary and, and it was ex-prisoners and ex-like kinds of offenders and basically got their heads together in jail and all that. And some of them had done some nasty stuff, do you know what I mean? But then like kinds of, in America, you know, as you know, like, you know, um, Christianity is a, is a massive thing. Yeah. But what happened was the fella who had the vision for the Calvary Commission is that he went to the judges and he said, listen, let me take some of these, the ones who we know are like, you know, real and genuine and all that. Let us take them. Let us like live on this farm or this retreat for like, you know, two years. No girls, no phones, no this, whatever, yeah. under the teachings of Christ and that. And basically, you know, let's see what we can do with them. And do you know what made the turnaround was phenomenal. Prisoners should get a chance to reform, shouldn't they? Absolutely, totally. And and that's what happened, Jazza, is when I went in, you know, I I I had I had no understanding where what, what I was gonna go into. And then I ended up going into like um, you know, penitentiaries, and then I ended up going into the high, the, the high end, do you know what I mean? The high end lockups, and it was like the lifers, and then we went into Livingston, which was death row, and that like type of thing, and um it was, it was, it was unbelievable. It was surreal. Do you know what I mean? Because you're talking to someone and some, some of them are just vacant. You just don't want to know yet. You know what I mean? But you had some of them who knew that they'd done wicked, horrible, evil things, knew that they'd been forgiven from God, knew that they were free in prison, more freer than people on the outside, yeah. knowing that they were going to go and meet the maker and yeah. knowing that like the consequence was that like, I might have to get the chair I have to get the, the needle or whatever and all that. He's waiting any day for the call up. Well, well, they they run years, aren't they, yeah. and that like type of thing. But then we run mostly we run um, we run the lifers. So it was three times like like life. Yeah. So it was a hundred years. Some of them had two hundred years. But you know there was a kid there. He was twenty two years of age, and it's got like three strikes and out. Do you know what I mean? So it's two misdemeanors and one major felon. And so basically. You know, you can get two misdemeanors can be anything. Do you know what I mean? But if you've got a major felony or whatever and all that, that goes against you. And it's 30 years and out. See you later. Lock key. Good night. Is Diana. that the three strike system? If you get, then it's 30 years. 30 years works, and yeah. out. What's no that, parole. Like two bad car crashes and stuff. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. It could be anything. Do you know what I mean? And there was this lad and he told me and all that. Like, and I'd just been starting to do the voice with the kids. You no, know, I was going to, like, you know, Reese Jones and all that, like, type of thing. So um, the Reese Jones thing and that like, so basically um, they were telling me their stories and it's, it's heartbreak. Do you know what I mean? They never had a chance in life, never had a chance whatsoever. And then he was telling me that like, you know, he was in a lift with his bed and that like, and this fella was like kind of tooled up and um, he was carrying. And next minute started dying his beards up and all that, like kind of giving like, you know, like, um, you know, innuendos to it and all that sexual innuendos and then next minute you know tried to front it and then next minute he like jumped in and said listen started getting into a scrap and all that the lad got stabbed lost his life and whatever and he got 30 years do you know what I mean 
So that was like, and so what he said to me, he said, listen, you've come from Liverpool. He said, the home of the Beatles. He said, you've come from Liverpool. He said, you know, I'd love you to bring all these kids from Britain and England and like kind of bring them over here and we'll tell them what the real deal is. You know the way the Johnny Rocks and the Johnny Concretes go around, yeah, not yeah. a screen crocky, you know what I mean? We'd like to talk about that and all that, like maybe another time and that like, do you know what I mean? What I did with the voice, with the kids, after Reese Jones got mm. shot. Because it was like kind of, I got prepared over there in order to get ready for not a screen and yeah. crocky and bring, you know, the communities. Before you tell us about coming back, what, what are your views on these people who do these horrendous crimes you're going to do, um, you know, they're going to get the lucky chair. What's your view on that? Should they get it or not? I, I, I don't believe in the lucky chair. No, I don't believe in, in, in killing people. You know, God gives life and God takes life and, you know, they do horrendous things and, and there's consequences for that and they should maybe never, like, kind of see the light of day. I, I don't know. I'm not a judge. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I'm not. I'm not a judge. I couldn't pull a lever, so no, therefore I, I wouldn't say somebody else pull a lever. Oh. What's your view, John? Oh, I don't know, Jazz. Because I've done my prep on that one, to be honest. With you. <laughs> <laughs> you just got me stumped <laughs> it in, right? Yeah, you have. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. Similar to what <laughs> it is. It, 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 it's, it's hard, and because you know we we we've all. I'm not saying like because people always take the self righteous things out there and go. Well, I never murdered anyone. I never killed anyone. Well, it says in the Bible that we all fall short of the grace of God. Do you know what I mean? So who am I to judge that person? And I seen massive transformation, life transformation of some people who were in life and doing bad things. And they became pastors and they became going back into the hood. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like me. I came from back in America. I went back in the hood. I'm back to another screen and crocky, and I ended up like kind of doing the voice with the kids about like you know challenging the gun knife and gang culture in another screen and crocky. I don't think I would have been prepared if I wouldn't have yeah, gone yeah. over there. But, um, can we talk about we haven't got long left? Sorry, Liam. Can we talk about you ran for councillor, didn't you? Yeah, can you just tell us about that briefly? What happened there? And it never, yeah, basically, um, I won a selection meeting, um. Three years ago in Norris Green, uh, I felt as though it was right to stand, uh, even though I knew the lad who was going to, like, kind of stand, you know, in Norris Green as well. And I and I just thought that having been a community activist for so long is that, like, you know, I, I, I know that I'd be a good community councillor because I'd represent those on the floor, do you know what I mean? Yeah. And so um, I, I remember going to a couple of friends and saying to them, you know, I, I feel as though I want to stand. And my friend was going to stand down anyway. She wasn't going to go forward. So it kind of fitted in, do you know what I mean? And it was like, okay, I'm going to go for it. So I won the selection um, and that was it. I was, <laughs> you know, I was ready to become, you know, the uh, the councillor. Where for was the that elections. for? Not a screen. Not a screen. I was ready to go for the the, uh, the, mayor, um, the local elections. And then what happened was, um the next day I got like this text from the local MP at the time was Stephen Twig. I got a phone call from the Labour Party and then I got a text from the Sun saying, um, <clears throat> my name's blah 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 and all that. We're gonna run a story on you on anti-Semitism. Um, you know, you've done all this and you've posted all this. It was three posts, you know what I mean? And basically what it was, it was when, I don't really remember in 2014, the Israeli government bombed a UN, like, hospital and 49, like, kids and young mothers died. And I was angry, you know what I mean? I I, I don't agree with the system that, that, that the Israeli government, like, run with mm. regards of Palestine and the way they treat the Palestinians. For me as a humanitarian, you know, God loves, you know, Jewish people, and God loves um, Israeli people. God loves the world, you know, for me. There's no labels for me, do you know what I mean? Whether you're Christian, Muslim, whatever. I don't yeah. believe in labels. Love your neighbor, you know, love God, love your neighbor, that's and that's it. Right. And so um, next minute, like the, the the text from the MP was like, you're gonna get a phone call and whatever. And I was like, what's all this? What's what's going on here? And so anyway, what happened was, was basically, um, I ended up getting like kind of a, a smear campaign, a vicious smear campaign aimed at me, calling me an anti-Semite 
and there was a homophobe. They, they, they called me a homophobe because this tweet had said about um, about no labels. The, the thread was about me not agreeing with labels, calling someone gay or whatever. It's like, I don't care. I don't care if the gay, straight, black, white, yellow, as long as you like kind of it would be building equality and fairness and you know, loving your neighbor and all that, like that's all that's my bag. That's what I want to be about. And so the 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 kind of um edited the, the tweet where it looked as though I was given a homophobic Who was this? The press? The press, yeah. So it was the echo. Yeah. The echo, the scum, the telegraph, mail. Um I got death threats and all that, like from um, you know, kind of pro Jewish kind of groups. Where do you think whatever. this come from, Liam? Do you think it come from who's Well, I, I I I truly believe it was it was a setup, do you know what I mean? Momentum at the time was supposed to be this representation for Jeremy Corbyn and for um you know the left of the Labour Party. And I knew like kind of you know the old people from from back in the day, the eighties and all that, but this momentum, these were like kind of there was something not right about them. There was just something that not right, and it was like the they were the Silicon Valley of the Labour Party or the Silicon Valley. You know, they're just trendies or whatever. They hadn't been in the Labour Party. They had no history or whatever and all that. And 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 it was like this kind of political correctness. You say one thing or whatever, you you, you judged and you know you you the world's worst and and whatever and all that. And so on three posts, what I said about anti semitism and I got drawn in by a senior Labour councillor when I was talking about Christianity, we were talking about Zion and Zionism. And I was, we were arguing about like, not arguing, debating about Zion and Zionism. And I said something meaning about like kind of, I talked about Rothschilds, meaning the bankers, not about like kind of this Jewish like conspiracy and whatever. You know, I've been to Israel, I love Jewish people and that. And so um, basically what happened was it was like Zionism, um, Rothschilds, and I said an elite race, meaning like the likes of neoliberalism, Trumpism, all that kind of stuff, the rich, the aristocracy, you know, where the poor are just getting shelled and that. And so, you know, next minute it was like screenshot of that nice one. And, you know, I got investigated by the Labour Party, but we were talking about like going down to the bottom or whatever. That took me down again to the bottom. Do you know what I'm saying? Because I got like, like victimised. I got threatened. I got bullied. And back in the day, I would have just knocked them out. Do you know what I mean? But I can't. I couldn't. I couldn't do that. You know, because do you think you never fit the bill in? People didn't want you in that position. Yeah, totally. And so there was a vicious smear campaign. And, and I went to the Momentum AGM and I got shot down. And there was this, like, people just shouting me down, shouting me down. And and for three years, John, I, you know, it took me to a dark place. I couldn't work, you know, I couldn't relate. I, I wasn't confident, you know. I've built my confidence back up over the last couple of years or whatever. Um, but, like, you know, my, sto my story or my side of the story has never, ever been shown or never, ever been, like, televised or never been, like, in the papers and Liam Thorpe won't, won't give my side of the story because it doesn't meet the narrative no more. Mm. Do you know what I mean? But what happened then, what happened back in, in then, and that, like, was absolutely, you know, it took me to dark places. I used to go to Waters Pool Prom every single day and look at them choppy waters. And it was only because of me faith. It was only because of me faith that, like, I was, like, strong and people believed in me and people were like, Liam, we know and all that, like, type of thing. Don't worry. But no one knows when you're kind of put out there and you're destroyed and you're victimised and, you know, and I'm not saying that, it's like... It's really frustrating, that. It's not frustrating, mate. It was... It, 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 it took me to the bottom of the barrel. It took me mentally-wise into dark dark places. I had no confidence. I had no fight. How long, we long, usually, how long years, was it? Now that time's, that time's passed. Is, it, is there a... Whenever something bad happens to me, Liam, I, it, as time passes, I have a, I'm grateful for it. Do you feel like that now? I feel like it. But have you took something from it? I have. I'm going to sit back. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because And also me a culpa. You know what I mean? Sometimes we've all done or expressed ourselves badly. Maybe back in the day or the terminology was wrong in what I said. 
But like, you know, and I, but what being I'm saying man, is... Being a man of God as well goes against you, doesn't it? When it yeah, totally, like, and I believe yeah. I was targeted, yeah. do you know what I mean, as a man of faith and a man of God, you know, in that respect, because, you know, um, that was that was, that was was the key as well in that. But for, they got on with it, they got on with life and all that, like, and say, let's just go and bully someone else, let's go and threaten someone else. Party politics, personal politics is horrible. It's disgusting. Do you know what I mean? The toxicity in this city... With, with local politics, it's absolutely horrible. And 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 it's like kind of, I'm thanking God that I had him to, to lean on because I would have gone under. I, I thought I was gone under, but like he held me and he got me and he and he brought me through. But it was the most horriblest experience I've ever, ever gone. Now I went canvassing with Stephen Yip because I believe Stephen Yip would be a great mayor because he's independent and he's open to, you know, he's not, like, under the banner of the Labour Party. And it saddens me to see that. But, like, you know, the Labour Party needs a washout. It well, needs the swamp cleaning out. We haven't got long left, sorry, no. Liam. The late, there's been a big mix-up now, hasn't it, in Liverpool, especially with the local council and stuff. Is it something that you're going to consider maybe doing again? I don't know, maybe. I, I, I don't know. I, but, but what I want to do is that I want to, like, kind of right the wrong. And, you know, three years, I held my hands up and said... I'm sorry if I've offended any Jewish people or, you know, um, the Jewish, like, kind of society or, or you know, within the, in, in Liverpool or the city or whatever, like, kind of the Jewish quarter or the community. And that I'm sorry that, like, you know, but I'm not, I'm not anti-Semitic. Do you know what I mean? I'm not, like, and what happened was is that because I went out canvassing with Stephen Yip the other week, they tried to regurgitate it again. And yeah, that like, yeah, type yeah. of thing. So they tried to bring it up again. And what effect you know, did that have on you? Well, it was it was time. It was time for me to come out of my cave. It was time for me to address the balance. It was time for me to face, you know, what 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 needed to be faced and that like kind of thing. Stronger mentally, stronger emotionally, stronger spiritually, stronger, like to kind of say, me a culpa, you know, I express myself badly. I apologize. I'm sorry. But you're not going to use it as a millstone around yeah. your neck for the rest of my life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When everyone else gets on with it, when everyone else has got skeletons in the cupboards, there I am, oh, laid it. naked before the city, crucified, do you know what I mean? Before the city, by the media, the local media, by, by like, senior councillors, by MPs at the time, and whatever and all that. Like, And I left the Labour Party. You know, people said I got through out, I didn't, I got a warning, and I, I left the Labour Party in disgust. Because you know why, John? is that they never looked after me and I could have threw myself in the mazy. I could have been dead. From that experience, I could have been dead. Well, I have. I am dead because I'm a different person yeah, yeah. than what I was. That's I'm what resurrected. I mean. You're, re you're grateful for the experience. Yeah, well, I am now. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? But I'm resurrected. And the thing is, is that you can't crucify a dead man. You can only resurrect him. Right. Well, One well, thing before we finish, um, what was it like for you facing these two hard times, one with Christ and one without I, I, do you know the footprints? I put it on 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 the Facebook yesterday, yeah. and that, do you know that poem footprints? Yeah. That that's that's it. You know when you think you're going through all the sketch and you're going through all the bad times and the struggle and the pain. And Christ said, "Listen, it's not going to be easy." Do you know what I mean? It's not going to be easy and all that. But no, I have overcome the world. I know that I have overcome the world. I know that this world has got nothing to offer me in that way. Do you know what I mean? And and so I know that he carried me through them toughest times. He carried me, Jazzy. He carried me, you know, and, and, and I know I'm a lot stronger for it. And hopefully, do you know what I mean? Maybe this story, because the story's not being told from three years ago, because it's like that or whatever. Maybe it's a redressing of the balance. And maybe it might be a start. We were talking about Terry and all that, and that like, and 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 Lawrence and whatever. You know, we were talking about it. It was like maybe it's a start of a, a new political system where we're nice with each other, where we're, we're kind with each other. We like, I disagree with you. You know, I disagree with like, but not bringing personal and calling people C U N T S and C W A T S and 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 swearing or whatever. Why can't we just have like some like a, a, a forum where it's like. You know, it's for the best of the city. We'll save that for another one. <laughs> no, but my brother ran for MP in Walton yeah. and he went as an independent 
And even I got shit. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? But we'll talk about it another time. Yeah, we will. Yeah. Liam, thank you very much no, for coming. God bless, thank that was you. the fastest hour ever, really, yeah, to man. me. Enjoyed it. <laughs> I enjoyed listening to your story. Thank, thank you. Really. No, thank you, Jazzy. Thanks, Liam. Nice one. Cheers. Next time on the How Are We Family Land podcast, we'll be speaking to Carl Evans. Carl put me through his program, and I didn't believe what Carl was telling me. I, I thought, no, you're going you're gonna to mess it up on me because yeah. I can't make weight that way. And Carl said, no, just trust me. Mm. Yeah. Eat, eat what I'm telling you. Just eat what I'm, just do what I tell you. All right, <laughs> okay, I will. Just trust the program. Well, again, that was it. I mean, talk about luck. It was through people like, like him and Molly just going... Do you know what? Go, go on, I'll trust you. Then I'll I'll give you a go, and then and then and then yeah, you know people have seen that, and it, but yeah, so we're working with a lot of like pro fighters one on one, and that's great. But the difference being is like I I speak to Jazz every day. We work with each other every day. We also do his S and C. We do Molly's S and C. But that relationship you can't have with like amateurs who are just coming up. Yeah, and they're the ones who probably need the help the most yeah. actually because they they've got no like like me, you know, like yeah. so. What we want to start doing is is offering like a, a suite of things that we can do in terms of education sessions, webinars, to give online, them the online programs, do you yeah. know what I mean? So we, we want to do it at every layer from the amateur fighter just getting started right up to the pro.